above all else. I feel like I want to rename the sermon today and the sermon next week to what we just proclaimed. Above all else. Lake Avenue Church, I need you to know that I am so grateful. I am so grateful to the Lord that he brought me to this congregation over 21 years ago. I am so grateful to be your pastor. And I know I'm just your acting senior pastor, but I am grateful. I am so grateful for the ways in which we have been the church these past many months. I need you to know that I brag about you, that when I talk to others and friends who serve in similar jobs as mine, they tell me to stop doting and quoting and talking about you as individuals in a collective body. I just want you to know I am grateful. Last March, who would have known? Who would have known what lay ahead for us, and not just us, but for all of us. And Lake, I I need you to know you responded with such a high level of faithfulness, such a high level of trust. We essentially, in about a week, had to change the way we did everything. And you and the staff of this church rose to the moment. I think about in those early days of the pandemic where everybody eventually got a phone call, especially those who are older, and we quickly came up with these neighborhood care groups where you could just let the church know what you needed, especially if you couldn't leave your home, and things began to show up for you as the church showed up for one another. I think in those early days of how quickly our family ministry team said, we're still going to do what we do and shape the next generation. I think about how quickly they came up with weekly ways to connect with students and children. I think back to summer with our camp week and how incredibly innovative and successful and proud I was, not just as the pastor of this church, but as a parent. I think about the parent trainings that I've sat in through our family ministries. I think about our amazing adult ministry, Pastor Janine Smith and her team and the division and all the leaders, how quickly we made changes and we had a women's tea online. Marriage mentoring is still happening. Adult classes are still meeting. You're still meeting during worship service times and I want you to change that but you're still meeting. Morning and evening break, small groups, and so many other and new communities are gathering to continue to be the body of Christ. Your benevolence giving out of this world. This last year, as you know, you gave $100,000 more to our benevolence offering, and I believe it's because the Spirit of God is moving in you to meet the needs for one another and the needs for those in this community that God has placed us. Our giving in general is simply mind-blowing. That in a matter of three days, four days, half a million, over half a million dollars came in, the reach of this church, the impact that we continue to have, although it's hard to connect those things for so many of you because of the isolation, I need you to know that God is using us at Lake Avenue Church to advance his gospel, to advance his name, and to be his hands and feet in this world in profound ways that we could have never imagined. Now, trust me, I for years have been praying for the day where we would come on a Good Friday or an Easter and every service would be full to the top. And the numbers that came in during Holy Week and the numbers that come in to watch our stream some weeks are just that, almost to the tune of three or four services. 
And, and most of all, I keep hearing stories and testimony about how you are following Jesus in the day today. And as Americans, if we can be honest, we have scheduled our faith in Jesus. And if there's anything that I believe God is doing in this pandemic is he's cultivating pure and intimate faith for those of us who call on Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, now let me be clear, in those early days of the pandemic, it wasn't all roses for us. There were really and are real issues. Mainly in those early days, the amount of people that I connected with and that we connected with in our church family who are of Asian heritage and how difficult it is and was for them to move around their normal life in the midst of the pandemic. Many of what came in to be met were those brothers and sisters of ours who didn't feel comfortable going back to that store because of the discrimination because of the comments and the racism that they experienced. But when we talked about those things as a church in those early days, I just sensed a different level of compassion and awareness and kindness from those of non-Asian heritage. There was something not right about what your brother and sister was experienced, experiencing that caused a level of love and compassion that I think felt new to me. In fact, I wrote in my journal mid-May that I sensed the Lord was bringing this body of Christ at Lake Avenue Church together in some new ways, specifically closer together with a new level of kindness and a new level of joy and love. And my journal entry was all about my gratitude to be here for what God is doing in this moment. But it wasn't too shortly after that journal entry <laughs> that there were two things that kind of crept into that space of kindness and joy and compassion. Two things that were happening outside of Lake Avenue Church and inside in some ways that seemed to shift the conversation away from kindness and gratitude to something a little bit different. And the first was this. There were some vocal, and there are, some very vocal churches and very vocal pastors who began to speak out against the quarantine and against the virus COVID-19. Some of what was being spoken out about was questioning the legality of what churches were being asked to do. Different pastors began to speak and not only speak on behalf of their congregations, but to speak on behalf of all Christ followers. And all of a sudden we had more of us questioning the legality and trying to hold our faith in one hand and the Constitution in another, even having questions whether this virus is real or not. That was one shift. And the other shift happened when our nation was hit with its other pandemic, its long-standing pandemic of racial injustice. Racial injustice that has always been around, but it came to the forefront in a very different way, specifically with the killing of George Floyd. If I can be honest as your pastor, gratitude and kindness began to start feeling distant. Distant not only in our nation's narrative, but in the larger church's narrative and even in some of the conversations and communications within our own church family. I began to see the division that I sensed God was healing begin to come back. And I need to tell you that as your pastor, this is an extraordinary time to be in leadership. Leading you amidst a pandemic, a hyper-partisan culture, a civil rights movement, and an upcoming election is new territory 
for me. And I know that it's new territory for you as well. These issues and many more have led me to the Lord in the ways I pray you're being led to the Lord. And that word for me is the word intimacy. Because I simply cannot do what's being asked of me if I'm not in intimate relationship with Jesus. If my inputs are news feeds and what human beings are saying, whether they're pastors or politicians, if that's my primary source of where I'm finding intimacy and direction, I'm in trouble. And so I have sought the Lord in some new ways, not just for my own soul, but because I believe that my job and what I will be held accountable for is how I was leading in this very unique and important moment. And so a couple of weeks ago, there were uh, two instances where I can say without a shadow of a doubt that the Holy Spirit met me. I can't say that all the time, but I can say it this time. And one of them was through a phone call and a text message thread with my friend Tom Hughes, who is the, the lead pastor at Christian Assembly, marvelous church and a marvelous man. And in so many ways, the way I'm sharing with you is the way he has shared with his congregation. And through that time of prayer and going back and forth, just having a friend to connect with in this moment, the Spirit was speaking to me on behalf of this body. And as I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, I go away at least one time a year for a few days by myself, primarily to reconnect with Jesus, but to also for our teaching ministry to ask the Lord, what is it you want us to study Jesus at Lake Avenue? And it was at that time up in the mountains, wildfires were burning all around me, that as I was walking, the Lord would just start dumping different scriptures in my mind and I wrote them down. And when it was all said and done, it was about 45 different verses that God gave me. And I didn't know what was happening with them. But as I continued to reflect on them and kind of group them and ask God, what, what are you giving me all this for? It became really clear. And what we're doing this week and next week is different. I am much more comfortable having three verses to talk about for 45 minutes than sharing with you today. I think it's 17 or 18 verses but I need to be obedient and I believe, and I've called this a pause, even though I think we need to call it above all else, that God has some things he wants his church at 393 North Lake Avenue to consider, to be reminded of, or maybe, it just maybe, in light of all that we're living in, that the word of God would become fresh and new for so many of us. I believe God has called us to a pause this week and next, and I'm going to ask you to pause, like take a full pause, which means here's what I'm asking. I'm going to send all these scriptures, this whole outline you will get after next weekend. I'm going to ask you to hold on if you feel the need to email me until we're done with the two weeks and to seek the Lord, to meditate on these scriptures and to ask God what he is doing in you and in us. I haven't hidden from the categories. Today we're going to talk about the nature of the church, the reality of sin and how that impacts the church, and specifically I want to talk about COVID-19 and our response at Lake Avenue Church. Next week, we're going to talk about the way God calls us to have discourse with one another in the church, we're going to talk about why God has set up a church to have leaders and how we're to interact with leaders. And we're going to talk very specifically around the division that is present in our country and the division that is present politically and the reality of what God says about what I think are the key issues for the follower of Jesus in this election around the dignity and value of human life and the dignity and value of human lives both inside the womb and outside the womb. I need you to remember something as we launch in. I am grateful and that I love you. And the name of this sermon is called A Grateful Nudge because I'm about to nudge a little bit. But my nudge is from a grateful heart and a loving heart. 
And I need you to know if this nudge starts to feel harsh or I sound self-righteous, that is not the intent. I need you to remember that this nudge comes from love and gratitude and that I am so proud of us. But as I do with my own family, what I want for us as a family is to flourish. To flourish often requires hard work, course correction, and nudging from those who love us and want our best. To be clear, it would be much easier to not preach what I'm preaching the next two weeks. But in John 18, when Jesus is in front of Pilate, and he's being questioned, this is right before Jesus is being going to be killed, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom, my kingdom is from another place. Lake Avenue Church, we are drowning in this world. And the kingdom of God cannot be contained in this world according to Jesus. It can be experienced, but it cannot be contained. And so today and next week, we're going to consider these six areas that I believe God is inviting us to have a kingdom perspective about and not a worldly perspective about. And the first category is, let's talk about the church just for a moment. Let's allow the scriptures to tell us about the church. I don't know what words you use when you think about the nature of the church. I'm going to suggest, and I hope you're writing things down, the three words I want you to, to think about this morning are the words salvation, sanctification, and mission. Salvation, being born again, being delivered from our sins through the person and work of Jesus. This is the identity. This is what we have in common as brothers and sisters, is that we have been saved through the work and person of Jesus Christ. And the church not only is a collection of those who have been saved, but preaches salvation. Sanctification that's the ongoing work of transformation into the likeness of Jesus. The process, once we have been saved, the journey we are on until God makes us complete in Christ, of becoming more and more like Jesus. And as you know, the journey of sanctification is much more like a roller coaster than anything else, with highs and lows and twists and turns and moments where victory and moments with defeat, but it's the ongoing process of becoming like Jesus. And mission, mission is the way of living that Jesus and the scriptures calls all believers in his church to be living. I think we say this really well when we've chosen Colossians 1, 28 and 29 to be a verse that's central to us in our vision. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to see salvation, sanctification, and mission here. Proclaiming Jesus. We have a value of this church of being an evangelistic community. That we proclaim Christ and the forgiveness of sins. And that what Christ did on the cross and through his resurrection, that we can be saved that we can be made right with God, salvation. Presenting each one complete in Christ, sanctification. We are saved through Jesus and we are in the process of becoming more like Jesus. Sanctification is part of the job of the church. And I love the we language here. I'll get you some better mission verses in a moment, but the we speaks to the mission that collectively we are the body of Christ. We are something together that God hasn't just saved individuals to be on their own individual journey of living out this mission, but that he's building a people, a body of Christ. You, you, you're acquainted, I pray, with the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, when Jesus said to them all, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. 
and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the gospel. The transformation through Jesus, that baptizing, recognizing the the redemptive work of Jesus and beginning life anew, baptizing them in the name of Jesus and in the Great Commission, do you see the sanctification? And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Salvation and sanctification, both central to what it means to be the church of Jesus. I love it in Ephesians 4, the sanctification gets, a, gets some teeth. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers, listen, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This scripture says so much about how Jesus set up his church to be. First, we see that he gave certain folks certain gifts to equip all the people for the works of service. This idea that we are being built up as this people, this body of Christ. And in evidence, the way we will know we're being built up is that we have unity in our faith. And when we have unity in our faith, we're becoming mature. Mature to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The process of becoming all that God intends us to be is that he's given us one another to equip one another. He's given us one another to experience unity. He's given us one another to become mature together. This is a role of the church. This goes farther back than just even the teachings of Jesus. In Genesis 12, this Abrahamic covenant, this this major kind of agreement between God and Abraham that we're living in today that Jesus fulfilled when he says to Abraham, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God, from the very beginning pages of Genesis, was making a people. Now, let's be clear. He's speaking to Abraham about the the people of Hebrew heritage at that time. He is not making a great nation into the United States of America. We know that through Jesus, all nations... All nations Jesus came to redeem and to save. But in the very beginning of the Bible, what God did was choose one particular people group. And he said, you and I, we're going to have a special relationship. And it's going to demonstrate to the rest of the world who I am. And that promise continues through the Old Testament and fulfilled in Jesus. And that covenant of of being used by God to be his people, to bless the world is what we are having the privilege to live in today. That's mission. We're starting to see some mission. Why are we here? In Jeremiah 29, it's a dark, darker moment in the people of God, the Hebrew people, the nation of Israel in their history. They're, they're going to be in exile, powerless, no standing, under someone else's rule and authority, And the prophet says in Jeremiah 29, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So in the midst of being powerless, in the midst of having no real standing, how did God instruct his people? The same God who made a promise to them that they're going to be a blessing to the rest of the world. He says, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease also. Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. 
Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. This is radical stuff. The people of God being strangers in a, in a foreign territory, having no standing, being in exile. God says these people who are holding you in exile, this, this powerlessness, I want you to flourish there. And we want all people to flourish there. We want the city to flourish. And so pray for the city, for the peace and the prosperity of the city. Essentially what God says, I'm putting you somewhere. And I want you to live there. And I'm giving you a mission while you are there. Be present, grow, multiply, pray for the peace and prosperity of the city which I have given you. More instruction in Micah 6.8 about how we are to live. What does faithful living look like? Yes, we're blessed to be a blessing and we're going to be in moments of exile and peace and prosperity. And Micah 6.8, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Justice. Mercy, humility. These are the words from God to his people at that time. At at a time that was clearly difficult. I want you to go about your lives seeking justice, showing mercy, and walking in humility. Turning to Jesus in Matthew 25. Jesus is, again, describing this way of living to those who are coming out to hear him teach and to his disciples. And it's so radically different from the way that the religious leaders had taught them to live or that the culture was celebrating. And he tells this story, famous story of the sheep and the goats. And the moral of the story, the, the, the pinnacle, when Jesus says, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for One of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me. And just a few verses later, the opposite. He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Justice, mercy, humility shows up in this teaching. And what we learn from Jesus is that how we speak, how we treat, how we sacrifice for the other person matters. And very specifically, what we do for the least of these seems to have a connection with how we will be judged and what the Lord will say to us one day. I I call this what my professor way back when at APU called, this is one of those jugular teachings of Jesus. It just kind of gets you there. I, I don't see an out. I don't see how you can contextualize that one away from, no, how we treat the least of these is how Jesus says you will be judged for. I don't see a way out. Which means that part of the mission of the church has as much to do with our salvation, our sanctification, and how we daily live in the world, in the city, in the place that God has placed us. We should pray for its peace and prosperity. We have to remember humility, justice, and mercy. We have to remember that there are vulnerable folk on the edge of society that we have a special call to. We're going to be in James for eight weeks, and I'm just warning you, talk about jugular. But in James chapter 2, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action, is dead. See, our mission as a church matters. But our mission ought to come out of our transformation, out of our sanctification through our salvation. As a good friend of mine and I encourage you to watch the podcast. Uh, Daniel Fong says, being informs doing. And although we have a mission to do and to be in this world, it comes out of our gratitude of being saved. And in our journey of being sanctified, 
we begin to put a handle on the work and mission that God has given us. So if the nature of the church is found in salvation, sanctification, and mission, and I believe that the Bible is full of this evidence. I've given you just a few scriptures. I believe we could do this all day. The Bible is also full with the reality of the struggle of the people of God living this way, being this kind of people. And that struggle throughout the scripture and in theology is called sin. Sin is what separates us from God. And in the Bible, we don't get very far into the story of God without sin showing up. Let me remind you. The first two chapters of Genesis are full of beauty and poetry in this creation story. The story teaches us that God has special intentions of intimacy with the pinnacle of his creation, human beings. That his desire in the way he created earth and all of creation was that man and woman, Adam and Eve, were very good. And that his desire was to walk with them in freedom first two chapters of the Bible are full of that beauty and poetry, but the next two chapters show how messed up and how harsh that gets really quickly. The next two chapters show the reality that in the midst of God's intended relationship with Adam and Eve, they rebel by listening to the serpent to not follow the instructions God gave them in Genesis 3. And then one of the first manifestations in this new sin-plagued world, we have the first family with brothers murdering one another. With one brother murdering. They didn't, anyway. What follows is the story of conflict and murder within a family as Cain killed Abel, Genesis 4. So by the fourth chapter of the Bible, we are well acquainted to the reality of destruction and deception of sin. Sin is what separates people from God, and sin is what separates us from living the way God calls us to live. And the Bible shows repeatedly that sin is manifest in three primary ways. And so if you're writing things down, I gave you salvation, sanctification, and mission for this section on sin. I want you to write down the devil, the flesh, and the world. The Bible teaches that there is a very real adversary, an enemy, the deceiver, Satan. The Bible teaches that the effects of sin in this world come in the form of our human flesh, meaning that we have personal choices. This idea of being human and what's inside each one of us to self-preserve and to be our own person is what drives us, our flesh. And we also can see the impact of sin is that there's the world around us, which at times our belief systems Sometimes are structures and systems and philosophies, ways that compete with God's intended way of living that just dominate out there. And sometimes in the world, we don't even know what is of the world and what is of God. It just permeates around us. But in each area, the strategy is the same. Whether it's the devil, the flesh, or the world, the strategy is separation and division. Separation and division from God Chapter 3 of Genesis, separation and division from one another. Chapter 4 of Genesis. As was the case in Genesis 3, the strategy of the enemy is to deceive and to separate people from God in God's ways. As was the case in Cain killing his brother Abel, our human flesh leads us to division and separation from one from other people, including our own reality. Separation, division, deception, jealousy, rage, and so many other adjectives can describe the realities that come from being in a a sinful people in a sinful world. And Lake Avenue Church, I want you to hear this. Sin is real. The devil is real. The flesh is real. And the world is real. And as true as those things are, Jesus teaches a powerful truth, not only about the reality of the enemy, But he teaches a more powerful truth about himself in John 10 when he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Life in Jesus and life to the full is one in which humans are in right relationship with God and one another. Life to the full recognizes both the truth and power that is only found in Jesus while also recognizing the strategy of the enemy 
to steal, to kill, to destroy, to divide. So when we live in these truths, when we are living in the fullness of Jesus, unity is stronger than division. Trust is stronger than suspicion. Love is stronger than hate. And grace abounding are just some of the markers of life to the full with Jesus. Yet the reality is that there's a daily battle at work to keep us from this kind of living. That battle is with God and with one another. So the devil, the flesh, and the world are all ways in which sin enters our lives and desires us to lead a life, desires us to be a church, or even live in this world that is marked by destruction rather than abundance. See, the Bible teaches that there's a spiritual dimension to all this playing out in Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is a battle happening in the heavenly realms that are seeking to keep us divided from God and divided from one another. And I believe that one way sin and the enemy gains traction is by bringing division, dissension, and mistrust within the body of Christ at Lake Avenue Church. I believe one way the enemy gains traction is when people see their brothers and sisters in the church as the enemy. While we're all in the process of sanctification, when we cannot see our brothers and sisters with compassion, with grace, with kindness, with love, we will miss out on the full life that Jesus offers. If I could be blunt, if Christians within Lake Avenue Church can be at odds with each other, those issues and those tensions can easily become the focus of the church and we, we can forget the larger mission that God invites us into And in doing so, we risk compromising our witness to salvation and we stunt our growth and sanctification. The call of the Bible is to a we over me all the time. The call of the Bible, especially in the church, is never a call of me versus you. Self-interest and division are not the markers of the church. Philippians helps us here. By saying, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Listen, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. When the church is empowered by the Holy Spirit to this kind of otherness, this kind of unity and humility, that's when we get the stories, friends. Those are the early stories of the pandemic, of how we rally alongside the needs of one another. And and we hear stories about people going to one another's homes and fixing the plumbing out of joy, or going to the grocery store out of joy, or paying one another's bills out of joy. And not only do we at Lake Avenue Church have an abundance of those stories over our 125 years of being a church, we take our cues from one of the first moments captured of this kind of abundance. In Acts chapter 4, all the believers were, in one, were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. And from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. One of the early evidences of this new church of Jesus Christ was that when they came together, their oneness, their unity, their needs became everyone's needs. And I am grateful that in the 21 years I've been at Lake Avenue Church, I've lost count of stories of how we have done that, how you have done that. But I will, and change gears here, we're coming to an end. 
I am concerned that this unity is not being fully experienced, and it's not just us. But one of the ways that seems to have the largest division right now among followers of Jesus is connected to this current pandemic, this current virus. Now, I want you to be clear, what you are not going to hear from me in this pulpit is naming other pastors or naming other denominations. That's not what I view my job to be. I don't think it's particularly helpful for our collective witness or unity. But I also want you to know I am very aware. I know what others are saying. I know how others are reading the same scriptures. I understand that we have lost some people who believe because of the choices that we have made that we're not uh, being faithful to God or to the scripture. I, I disagree with those assessments. I've tried several times during these past few months to share with you how we at Lake Avenue Church are leading and living as we are being led by the Lord. And I've done so with the desire to speak about us. There are other pastors who have been given a much larger platform. That's not one I feel led to have at this moment. I've done so with the desire to speak about us and us alone. But the division is quite real. And that division is present even in this congregation over how the church responds to this pandemic. And I believe when I receive notes telling me that some of you are withholding your tithe to Lake Avenue Church until we meet again, letting me know where your tithe is going, when I receive uh, forwarded emails of what other pastors are saying, and you're encouraging me to be faithful as they're being faithful, insinuating that we're not being faithful, when I hear uh, directly, anonymously comments uh, about how there's no real pandemic and this is all just, I don't think this ought to be brothers and sisters in the church. I think God has placed us in a local body for salvation, sanctification, and mission. And we have to remember that the flesh, the devil, and the world are going to fight against that all the time with the strategy of division. But I, but I think for a moment we need to talk about this division in light of the pandemic. Uh, I know there's differing perspectives, but there are some common scriptures being cited. So let's just look at them for a moment. In Acts chapter 4, before what we just read, Peter and John are being called out, being threatened, because they've been preaching in the name of Jesus. And it says in verse 18... They called them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. This is one of those verses that is used often in this moment. Believing and what's being said is that the government or the county or the state or the federal government is inhibiting the church from speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus. And I just have to tell you that's not true. I haven't received one letter, one piece of instruction that said, hey, Jeff or Lake Avenue Church, you can't speak about Jesus. In the very beginning of this pandemic, I was on a phone call with the county public health. And on that phone call, what I heard was a lot of empathy and understanding from even secular people that the role of the church is critically important and they wanted to do all they could do to make sure we could stream now, have they fumbled? Yes, it's a worldly system. Do I agree with all the decisions that have been made? Has there been inconsistent? Absolutely. But if we can't go to the Rose Bowl to watch a football game or go to a movie, I mean, are we the, I don't think the church is being singled out in this moment and, and the interest of public health. Now, I get it. You probably disagree, but I don't think we can use Acts chapter 4 as this moment where we're like John and Peter, where the government is saying, don't speak in the name of Jesus or else. I don't think that's what's happened. In fact, I believe we have been speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus in some profound ways with great impact. 
I think you and the stories I hear about the way you're loving your neighbors, the way in this pandemic moment people are more open to the gospel that you are speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus in some profound ways. I do not believe that there has ever been a time in the history of Lake Avenue Church where we have stopped speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus. We have not stopped being the church. How we are being the church has changed, yes. There's another verse that's often quoted. Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So a phrase that can be out there right now is that churches that are holding to what is being asked of us by government officials are somehow serving man and not serving God. That we're obeying Caesar, not the Lord. Now I hope you can see that a responsible reading of Romans 13, that it's quite possible that obedience to God can be seen by obeying this scripture in Romans 13. That God instructs us that the government is here for our good and we're to obey them. Now, I think that doesn't mean we always obey. I'll get to that this week and next week a little bit. But, but I think pitting against one another that somehow we're fearful of man in this moment, I think what we're doing for us at Lake Avenue Church is taking the scripture very seriously. Clearly, when the government is ordering people to deny their faith in Jesus, and if that ever happens, I guarantee you, we will disobey. When the law of man is in violation with the law of God, that happens all the time in this nation and other nations. We always have to obey God. And if that day comes in real persecution, I guarantee and believe that this church will be found faithful to follow the law of God over the law of man. Obedience to the government in a democracy is just so interesting to me, especially in light of this John 18 passage that we start about, that the kingdom of God cannot be contained in this world. Romans 13 is this kind of like hip verse we use for when the culture and the government are doing things we like, we say we ought to obey, and when they're not doing things we like, we can say we don't need to obey. I've sat with my own self to go, why is it on this particular issue I'm kind of like, yeah, rise up, and on this particular issue I'm like, no. Because when it agrees with what we already believe, or it agrees with our political platform, or it agrees with how we've been discipled to think about something, we're easy to say, you should never protest, speak up. So in the same moment, we have some who follow Jesus who say, uh, we should be meeting the church, this is all, let's forget that statute, but there should be no protesting happening in the streets. It's a culture confused to me. So I don't know if we always obey. In fact, I think U.S. history is full of great advances because brave people chose to stand up to wrong, unjust, and unfair policies. And we'll talk about that more next week. But with COVID-19, COVID-19, and in light of Acts 4 and Romans 13, I can't say it better than my friend Tom said to his church at Christian Assembly. He says, it is quite possible that different Christians and even different congregations may arrive at different thresholds upon which they believe that a government official is ordering them to deny their faith. This is not a commentary on any other Christian congregation's actions. Instead, we are writing to help the people of Christian Assembly Church stay humble and open-handed towards one another by seeing that different Christians may arrive at different actions on these matters without, and this is the part I want us to hear, without degenerating into judging the quality or strength of another's faith. One of the things I love about Lake Avenue Church is the differing positions, that we all can come at things a little bit differently. But when we start judging one another and the severity or the sincerity of someone's faith, that's when I believe division and sin enter. Another verse that's being cited during this COVID-19 is in Hebrews, So many of you have shared this with me. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, I think it's really important here. The context of Hebrews 10 wasn't that people weren't meeting together because the government was stopping them. This speaks more to just personal discipleship and personal habits and choice versus government mandates. 
This is an issue, I believe, in Hebrews of the flesh, not of the world. And I agree that this has been incredibly disruptive to the way we know how to meet together, but we have attempted to live this out during this quarantine, and we will keep living this out. And I'm Zoom tired too. I bought blue light glasses because I'm getting dizzy. I don't like it. I want to be back together. But I don't think we've stopped meeting together. And we are looking continually and asking the Lord to lead us to the next level of meeting together. Some of you know this. That in just a couple of weeks, we're going to begin a Sunday night service outside because we believe that's where guidance and where wisdom allows us to do. You also know that we're preparing this massive facility God has given us so that when we can move indoors, even with lower numbers, that we're going to do that wisely, quickly, and nimbly. We are not sitting by the side just waiting this thing out till a vaccine. We have had more plans drawn up, thrown away, drawn up again, put away, than, than I could even begin to take time to speak of. But I want you to know that we are considering how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. We have incredible efforts in place so that we might not give up meeting together. I remember I was listening to Pastor Albert speak many weeks ago. He was talking about the difference between blockbuster video and Netflix and how disruptive that was to the movie industry. The whole way you came to get a movie and leave your house and go to a store and pick it up. And then Netflix came and just dropped a whole new way of doing things. And blockbusters no more. I don't think how we used to meet is akin to blockbuster and that now everything will be online. But I do wonder what the long-standing impact of this will be of how God's people meet. And surely you know this, because Lake Avenue Church, you are a global missions church. You do know that the way most of the world meets and gathers for worship service is quite different than the way we meet. And the Spirit of God seems to be faithful and to show up and to call more people into faith and people growing in their faith and the mission of God being served throughout the ends of this earth. It wasn't soon after I got back from Turkana that we went on lockdown and I shared a picture with you of the worship service I was at and it was alive. I believe God isn't done writing how the church in the United States will meet. I think we're living at a difficult time. But Jesus says this in Matthew 16. Jesus says he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So Lake Avenue Church, I'm calling you and me to have biblical faith. Biblical faith, the Bible is full of seasons of struggle. We go to story after story about God even withholding his presence for a time being, where the people of God were tested, where, where they had to do these things and walk around temples, and, and there were long-standing periods between when God spoke and, and things happened. And, 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 and surely this is difficult, but it's not outside of what we can read in the scriptures. The people of God have survived exile. The people of God have promises from Jesus himself that in this world you will have trouble. The Bible is full of teachings against fear. The Bible is full of teachings towards mission, towards salvation, towards sanctification. See, I believe Lake Avenue Church that God is doing something in this, all of this. I don't think for a moment I have a theology of God's presence that says he's not surprised by any of this and that even in this season, he is building his church and his people to be more effective in being the church that calls people to faith in Jesus, the church in which we grow in our faith in Jesus, that we're being sanctified and that we're living on mission with Jesus in this world. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be a part of this body. And I believe our best days are ahead of us. Amen.